awakening is just becoming aware, you know, aware of what's real and what's true. And that's kind of what my basic mission is all about, just awakening people to the truth and reality. The life experience of what I've come to understand basically is that there's 8 billion people on this planet with no exception. We are all born into a life plan, a sort of destiny, but that destiny also travels along with free will and choice. So what you have is a basic plan, a strategy or whatever, but there's many choices to make. So you're deviating with certain paths as you go about completing your life plan. And in order to do that, you agree before you're born what your life plan is, what your task will be, and you swear that you're going to try and remember. That's the key. The people who wake up in awakening and remember are the ones that have the highest success rate and the greatest rewards, I assume, in the afterlife. And that, you know, it's just not your first best destiny. And if you really want to do that, you got to do things like you're doing and like I'm doing, and you got to get out there, step out and start communicating and start making things happen, taking action in your life, making choices that lead you to basically helping other people and doing good works. And I'm just stepping up, I guess now. I went through my life path, all the different things I had to go through to get to this point in time. Welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. This show is for entrepreneurs. They have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Moon. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary. Challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to this week Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. I've got a very special guest. His name is Mark Fiorentino, and he's the author of Master of Reality, which is a book about the completion and the solution of Einstein's unified field theory. The book contains many other world-changing discoveries like create an anti-gravity field, uh, how to break the light speed barrier, and how the Big Bang Theory, a proper explanation of how it all works, how our stars, our system, our universe is actually created. And he started learning about all this at the age of 10. I'm probably still like playing with rocks and stone when I was age 10. And then he went on to work a long career in the IT industry, um, the tech industry, including work with IBM and created a lot of systems. But he's like, Batman, like in the daytime, he'll be doing his job, but at nighttime, he'll be like having a special crusade, discovering the universe. And I'm so glad that he wrote the book, Super Relativity, that explains a lot of these concepts in depth, including UFO and how to recreate these uh, UFO like spacecraft as well. So welcome, Mark. Oh, thank you for having me. Gary. it's good to be here. So the first thing that really caught my eye is that you've got a YouTube channel. And the first thing it says, like the title is called The Awakening Theory of Super Relativity, the Unified Field Theory. So why the awakening and what is the relation to super relativity and the unified field theory? Well, awakening is just becoming aware, you know, aware of what's real and what's true. And that's kind of what my basic mission is all about just awakening people to the truth and reality. That's why I had the book Master of Reality. So the unified field theory and how it relates to super relativity is basically super relativity is an extension of Einstein's series of special and general relativity. They weren't really wrong in any way. They were just needed to be extended some to complete the theory of everything, or which is the unified field theory, in my opinion. And so what is the unified field theory? That the thing that Einstein 
quite literally worked on to the very last day of his life. He was lying in bed, still working on equations at the moment of his death. It's a great quest, and I always wanted to see it completed. And for many years, I was reading from the age of 10 on up, looking, searching for anybody to solve the problem. You know, in the early years, I never really thought I would do it. I thought I would read about it, and somebody else would do it, and I would, you know, get enlightened and be happy with the knowledge. But so I kept reading, kept searching, kept learning. And after a while, theories began to form in my mind, especially about reading how Einstein, what he was thinking. And I really read for that. I wanted to know what was in his mind, his model, his mechanical model. What your parents have a background in physics? Like, and how did you stumble across the information? Because back then the internet wasn't around. (laughs) Well, at the age of 10, I was going to catechism. My parents don't have any kind of science background. My father was an immigrant and came here from Italy. And my mom's parents also came from here from Italy. She was living in Brooklyn before she got married, Brooklyn, New York. And so that's my background. I was going to church, uh, Catholic, and they, the nuns there wanted us to find a saint born on our birthday. So I went home and I asked my parents, nobody knew of anybody on March 14th, not a big day, I guess, for saints. And uh, so I went to the calendar and I saw Albert Einstein's name was on on my birthday. So I went and started reading. I went down to the encyclopedia that was in our house and I started reading and I just fell in love with the guy, fell in love with physics and science and was inspired by what I read that day. And um, also got into the unified field theory, which I think I read about the same time, I guess, once I got interested in, in his quest for that, that really f- fueled the flame of, you know, wanting to uh, find out what is going on here, basically. I mean, that's what it's all about, just figuring it out, understanding it. So um, that's how I got into it. That's how I got into the whole science thing, physics, just a love for knowledge and truth and a, and a bit of curiosity. Um, part of me is thinking that, could it be that part of um, Einstein reincarnated into you and through you to finish the work? Well, let me tell you a little story about, a little more detail about that. I was living at, well, I was born in Somerville, New Jersey. It was about 20 miles from where Einstein lived. Einstein lived all the way up until around April 15th or 18th, somewhere a month after I was born. I was born in March 14, 1955, and he passed away in April, January, February, March, April, a month later. So I'm not, no, I'm not a reincarnation of Albert Einstein. There is more to that story. Also, by the way, I was born only 20 miles from where he died. He died in Princeton. And I live very, very, very close to Princeton, New Jersey. So there are, you know, some links there, some strange synchronistic links. And when I come out with my next book, there's a whole story that really delves into the Einstein relationship that apparently I have, which I will reserve for, it'll be on the end of that book. So that's quite a story, but not going any further there, I would just like to say, yes, there is a connection across time and space, basically. And um, there had to be, in order for me to figure this out, um, I had to have had help. There's no way I did this. I'm a very ordinary person for the most part. And somehow I've managed to accomplish an extraordinary thing. And that's part of the mystery and the miracle of all of this. Uh, a guy coming out of nowhere, basically, I have a technical background, but certainly not one that would indicate that this guy's going to solve the unified field theory, and I, along with the math, and I'm not that particularly good at math, but I just happen to understand the modeling concept and to derive the math, I guess you would say, so that I could explain this. And I'm working on a paper now that's about to reveal 
once and for all and makes the logical proof and mathematical proof for the unified field theory, how gravity, mass, and inertia mechanically work and linking them up to electromagnetism. That was what Einstein wanted us to do. And what he was trying to do, basically he thought electromagnetism and gravity emerges aspects of a single fundamental field. He was right. And that has been done now. Wow. It reminded me um, the one of the books I was listening to yesterday by uh, Dolores Cannon about past lives and, and people that's crossing over to the other side. It says, when I was connecting to the spirits, it was revealing that a lot of the ideas of the of the music, the art, and the inventions, they'll broadcast it to humanity when it is ready. And I guess the idea of the unified field theory was broadcasted to many or maybe just a few people, but Einstein was one of the ones that was in the right vibration or right frequency to pick it up. The information was still there, ready to be downloaded, and you were there at a similar vibration to be able to download it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, I think. I think that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, the life experience of what I've come to understand, basically, is that We are all, there's 8 billion people on this planet, with no exception, we are all born into a life plan, a sort of destiny, but that destiny also travels along with free will and choice. So what you have is a basic plan, a strategy or whatever, but there's many choices to make. So it's, you know, you're deviating with certain paths as you go about completing your life plan. And in order to do that, you agree before you're born, this is I discovered from reading about NDEs, uh, what your life plan is, what your task will be, and you swear that you're going to try and remember. That's the key. The people who wake up enough, awakening, and remember are the ones that have the highest success rate and the greatest rewards, I assume, in the afterlife that you, you know, you can come here and just have a good time. Yeah. And a lot of people do that. And it's not that it's judged bad or anything. It's just not your first best destiny. And if you really want to do that, you got to do things like you're doing and like I'm doing. And you got to get out there, step out and start communicating and start making things happen, taking action in your life, making choices that lead you to basically helping other people and doing good works. And that's what I'm basically doing now. This is an adventure that I've come to realize was mine from birth. And I'm just stepping up, I guess, now. I went through my life path, all the different things I had to go through to get to this point in time. So you're on to something. I think you have the right idea. Yeah, I'm like when I started studying like numerology, and I just, again, I'm not big in maths or physics, but I remember in maths, like in high school, we were learning about Pythagoras theorem. And it's like, this guy is also the same guy that's creating numerology. Like this maths genius is also the same guy that's looking at concept beyond our reality. And everything that you can pretty much look at on how life is, it can be broken down to how it's being constructed. Kind of like the matrix, like background, it's got like zeros and one, everything is programmed. You look at the geometrical patterns of a sunflower or any flower or broccoli is is so magnificent in the creation. So part of me is again, like thinking that there must be something to do with pneumology and astrology that your birthday is in the same day as, as Einstein that allows you to be great at pattern recognition or have certain skill set that allows you to decipher some of these information that for most people, and, and especially myself, it's like the thought of even understanding the concept is a, whoa, it's so difficult, but you have this ability. Um, yeah. Yeah, you've hit on something, something that I thought about. I've given this some thought about how I've managed to pull this off, and it is really pattern recognition. That seems to be the thing that I was really good at. And so I said, well, okay, let's, let's see if there is something to that. So I went online and I took an IQ test for pattern recognition, and I did score pretty well. I fell asleep twice during the test because I was tired that night, and I was sitting in an easy chair when I was taking it. I hope that didn't affect my score too much, but I got over 140. So I said, well, that's definitely way up there on the pattern recognition. 
scale. So I do have a talent for that. So I was born with that, apparently. And um, apparently, I was assigned this task. And this is a very hefty task. I mean, bringing the unified field theory into the world is a really tough assignment, especially for a non-physicist. But you know what? Through infusion, which basically you might call it channeling or something like that. In some way, I was able to connect to the source. And if you want to know how something works, you go to the creator of that something and you ask him. And basically, after a while, that's exactly what I did. And I do not apologize for it. It utilized all the resources that were available. And certainly there's resources available, great wisdom to be had if you can connect to the other side and ask them questions directly. And in my book, I actually use a NDE person who discovered something that I was looking for. And I realized that might be out there because of intuition, a hunch, a guess, a feeling to look for this thing on the internet. And I did find it and I did find the person. So if you want knowledge, the highest form of knowledge is not so much just the intellect, you know, reasoning things out. There's a higher form, and that form is in knowing. When you just simply have something infused into you all about it, and that's what happens when you're on the other side, when you're connected to the source, God, to everything, you can have knowledge that comes right into you directly, not through words, Words is a primitive, you know, very limited way of getting knowledge. Language, words, math, all that. Not as powerful as in knowing. And part of what I got, I got that way. I just could see things in my mind. I would lie awake late at night. And um, this happened for years while I was writing the book. And I would visualize like, like Einstein did. I would look at particles and I would watch them. So I used my mind as a lab. And it was a very effective way to learn about things. So definitely we're on to something using these techniques, these more advanced techniques that are being used by many people now. So Mark, tell me why is your book called um, The Master of Reality? Basically, that's what I studied. I studied the nature of things, how things really are, you know, and that includes knowledge and philosophy of knowledge. And that's why I call myself a metaphysician. That's what it's all about, reality. So in learning about the unified field theory, learning about how particles work, how fields of force work, this is all about reality, the physical reality. It's a particular dimension that we live in and we exist in. There's more dimensions and there's more universes. But I tried to keep keep it mainly to this one because, you know, to, to understand it all, you have to be connected directly to the source. And it's hard enough getting this reality figured out. So I only branched out a little bit just to see the bigger picture every once in a while. But master of reality is just that, you know, passing on the knowledge of what's real in this world and how it works mechanically. Okay, so can you break down like what the unified field theory is for the people, like including myself, in the very layman's term that um, what was Einstein working on and what did you extend to further discover? Sure, that's very easily done. Electromagnetism and gravity emerged as aspects of a single fundamental field. So that's all the unified field theory is. So let's break down that sentence because that's what I did. First of all, electromagnetism needed to be, uh, what's the word, deconstructed. There's actually two fields there, and they typically coexist together in particles. Um, They always do, actually. And so electromagnetism, I broke out into the electrostatic field, which is the Coulomb force, and magnetism. So thanks to James Clerk Maxwell, he was able to realize that they were interrelated and did the formulas and the work to discover that electromagnetism is really a particle, it's a twist of space, that's the electrostatic field. And that twist, uh, because of its structure, moves. And when that twist moves, the space around it rotates. 
So as the charge is rotating, is moving through space, the space is adapting to that twist and rotating as the thing moves. That's electromagnetism. That's two thirds of the unified field theory already worked out by James Clerk Maxwell, thanks to the work of Michael Faraday who came before him, who realized somehow that charges moving in wires made magnetism. You never have magnetism without a moving charge. So that's two thirds of the unified field theory. Then there was the other aspect, which is gravity. Gravity seemed to be separate at the time, but everybody suspected somehow it was created in some way associated with electromagnetism. So I linked the final part. And the single fundamental field that all these forces come from was called the ether. And I realized that we needed to bring back the ether it was improperly discarded in the year 1905. So I wrote in my book many chapters proving the existence of the ether and reestablishing it as the fundamental field. So now we have the fundamental field. We have the electrostatic charge, the twist of space. We have the magnetic field, the rotation of space around that charge. Now I had to figure out a way to create gravity from the motion of an electromagnetic charge. That's the only way to link everything together. It was through motion. The electrostatic charge has motion due to its structure. When it moves, it creates the magnetic field. Through motion, the magnetic field emerges into reality. It's a secondary field of force. And what are fields of force? Fields of force are just bendings of space. The ether is the fundamental flat field. It's, you could think of it as a Euclidean grid, a flat grid, until you apply a force to it. So the ether is really a quasi-elastic solid that exists everywhere and in everything. It's the only thing that exists. Everything else is made from it and is a part of it, consubstantial with it. Particles are consubstantial with the ether. If you look up that word, if you don't know what that means, it means made of the same thing. So they are structures, uh, configurations of space, and they move through space. And when they do that, they cause space to bend. Magnetic field is a rotation of space. Gravity is a contraction of space. So that's what Einstein was trying to do. He was trying to figure out the way that electromagnetism could, you know, link to gravity. And that's what I did, thanks to Einstein's help, who left a lot of clues behind. So that's what the unified field theory is all about, basically. Mm. Does that um, explain on how matters are created? Like, what is it? The trees, the humans, the table, the chairs? Mass, yes. Mass. Inertia and gravity, in my theory, they're all the same thing. They're different circumstances. And how do they create? Um, so let me give you an example of the unified field theory, how mass is created. And it comes from uh, particles like neutrons and protons. They create their own mass. The, what they call the rest mass, it's really not true. There's no resting involved inside of the proton and the neutron. And thanks to a discovery I made uh, from a person who had a near-death experience who talked to God, God explained to him how mass and matter was created, how he did it. The creator did it. If you want to know how something works, go to the person who did, who created that thing. And so now I will show you. This is what's oh. going on inside of the, elect of the proton and the neutron. This is a trefoil knot. Uh, as you will see, it's very good at keeping things together. The three quarks, there happens to be three quarks inside here. They're moving at 99% the speed of light according to my theory, a little above that. And they're moving so fast, this thing becomes a solid device. The electromagnetic waves are moving so fast that this whole thing solidifies and it holds the quarks together. That is the binding force. That's what keeps the neutron and proton together, not the gluon. That's a fiction. 
according to my theory, it's this dynamical structure, the same kind of dynamical structure that Albert Einstein was looking for. I found it in this person's NDE and I incorporated it and built upon it uh, to, to let me just say this right here, not only creates the strong binding force that holds these three quarks together, but it's moving so rapidly, it's moving in an accelerated manner. That's important to realize. Einstein said acceleration and gravity somehow are the same thing. That's called the equivalence principle. So he gave me a clue, a link that I, I kept searching. Well, there must be an explanation for this, a physical explanation for why acceleration causes mass to appear, causes gravity to certainly causes inertia, resistance. There's no doubt when you hit the gas on your car and you accelerate and you feel pulled back in your chair, something real is happening. And that reality, that inertial pull that feels like gravity pulling you back is caused by acceleration. And quite simply, how acceleration causes mass is that it, I have a definition here. Gravity is caused, or mass, gravity is caused by accelerated motion of fundamental unbalanced charges. When charges move in this way, they cause the space in and around the particle to contract. Remember that word, because gravity is contraction of space. Gravity is a contraction of a spatial medium, the ether, the fundamental field. <laughs> this is how this all links. This is what he said it would be like. Mass is a property of space and caused by particle motion relative to a stationary space. Matter acquires its mass as a result of its inertia, which causes the space around and within the particle to contract. Gravity is a contraction of space. This is the completion of the unified field theory. I've just given you the mechanical model, the same thing Newton would have done had he been able to figure it out at that time. Uh, he would love this because it's all mechanical. There's no quantum mechanics required, no probability waves, no probability predictions. It just is cause and effect. Great. So by understanding this concept, are there any real life application? I know that in your book that you go into like creating different spacecraft, they can travel to different planets and maybe even galaxies. But I guess to a lot of people that are still living their everyday life on earth, are there any application that they could apply knowing this information? Oh, lots of them, lots of them. <laughs> you know, I wanted to figure out gravity because I also started reading UFO books when I was in my teenager years. From then on in, I read them looking for clues because I figured, well, advanced races already have solved the unified field theory. And they seem to also have figured out how to create anti-gravity. So he who figures out gravity, the first one that figures out gravity is going to know how anti-gravity works. This is just going to be a kind of a same mechanism evolved, only a reversal of the space contraction. If gravity is contraction, then what is anti-gravity? Expansion? Exactly. It's just that simple. It never was any harder than that. Somehow we have to figure out how to make space expand. And there's where all the interesting applications come in. Now that we have mastered the knowledge concerning gravity, we can turn our focus to the creation of anti-gravity. So I had to search back through time, looking for more clues, understanding that what I needed was a way to stretch space. And I found it, I call it the slip wave. The slip wave is how the, the mechanism that particles use to move. You know, in, in physics, it's a total mystery how particles move. They just, uh, they call it kinematics. They put the movement of particles and forces in their equations, but they don't discuss the cause. They just use, well, they has momentum. This particle has momentum. Ask them, well, where did it get that momentum? 
It has momentum. That's what you get. The particle has mo- Stop asking questions. <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about where it comes from. We're just going to talk that it has it and, and accept that. You know, it's like, is it magic? No, there's a, a reason why particles have momentum. And I discovered that and I applied it to creating an anti-gravity field, which is what is a tremendous application it has many things that we could build a supercar drones that can uh, take uh, things very cost effectively into outer space. If we need to build a really big space station, this becomes very affordable using anti-gravity. If you use rockets, you'll break the bank because it takes way too much money and effort to put up a, you know, a 500 pound payload into outer space. It costs millions of dollars for every you know, few pounds. So let's back down from that. Imagine being able to carry up a a thousand or ten thousand pound load just floating it into this outer space using the technology of anti-gravity so yeah there's a tremendous amounts of of things plus building spaceships that can break the light speed barrier which is a tremendous um it's going to be the greatest discovery of humanity greater than fire greater than the television and the radio and the telephone and the car and the plane Anti-gravity is going to change everything in this world. What is normal? We're going to meet people from other planets. We're going to have, it's just expanding our knowledge and not only of technology, but of religion and so forth. It's just going to be a real breakthrough for all of humanity. And I hope it leads to a utopian society at some point. Cool. Well, you've talked about space quite a bit. The other concept that I guess in my track of this awakening journey, like came across is time. And based on a lot of the ancients or a lot of the spiritual discovery or channeling is it talks about that time is an illusion is the man-made concept. And I think I will I'll watch a video talking about Einstein that when he was on the plane or whether he was on the train, the speed that the vehicle is moving or the plane is moving, time is not the same as if you're on the ground. So what is your concept of time? Yeah, I have a chapter in my book where I talk about that because it's something that if you're a philosopher, you start thinking about how does this work and what can we do? Can we time travel? Can we do all those kinds of things? And so I broke it down and time in this dimension, in this physical realm. It is a sort of an illusion. If you look at the bigger picture, it is. You can definitely say that. But it emerges into a physical reality because something else has to exist in order for there to be time intervals that we can measure and observe. I think Einstein says it here when he's talking about the ether, as a matter of fact. In order for time to exist, I say this, that space has to be a real physical thing. And I will explain this. Distance equals rate times time. Now, many physicists believe that outer space is made of absolutely nothing. It's a complete void. So that, I say, cannot be true. Space has to be a real thing. It is a quasi-elastic solid. If space were not a real thing, and if you try to solve that equation for how long it takes to travel a specific distance, if that distance is equal to zero, because you're defining it, Mr. Physicist, as equal to nothing, therefore it can have no value other than zero. If it has the value of zero, then it takes no time to travel any distance in outer space, no matter how far apart we measure. If there's nothing in between those two points in outer space, it will take zero time for light to travel. And we never see that. It always takes time. So as Einstein said in the ether and general relativity, recapitulating, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. For in such space, there would not only be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for standards of space and time. 
measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in physical sense. So what I'm saying, and what he's saying, I'm just agreeing with him, space has to be a real physical thing. When it becomes real, then time emerges as something that we can measure and experience in this realm. But if you go further, if you look at the bigger picture and you go into the afterlife, there is no time there that we can really relate to. And so in the bigger picture, there is only the moment, hmm. the eternal moment, past, present, future, all occurring at the same time, which means something very important. Time travel will become possible because all you have to do is create a portal connecting you from one time dimension or time segment to another. And that's how you would do it. But th that's, you know, to, to agree with what you say and say, yeah, it's an illusion because our minds are able to process um, intervals of time and, and record events and so forth only because there's a physical distance that exists. And when that happens, it takes a certain amount of time to traverse a distance, then suddenly time exists and it exists in a very linear, you know, arrow pointing forward all the time. Can't go back, but only forward. And that's how time works in this reality, this physical dimension. Wow, that's interesting. Because again, like going to some of the channeling work or, or uh, Dolores Cannon's work, when it talks to different, I guess, ETs, some of them travel by UFO and they've got spaceships. Some of them, it's just a thought and they just appear in that location. And I guess that's what you're referring to. Like some, if you're still operating with a physical realm, physical body, then you can create different craft that can travel extremely fast. But if you don't even have a physical being, you can just zoom in when you want. Well, that's when you're on the other side, you think you're there instantly. You move at the speed of a god. You want to go out to the far reaches of our universe and look at it from a great distance. You'll see it as just a ball of light. All the galaxy, all the stars are just this one bubble out in space in the middle of all this great expansion of space. And you're there like, like that uh, through the power of intention, through the power of thought. That's what happens when you pass away. You get reconnect with God in the other side. Uh, that is completely possible. You can move anywhere with it. Now, there may be, very well may be, well, I'm certain there are alien species that are millions of years more evolved. Can you imagine us in 10 million years of more evolution? We're not only going to advance technologically, but you could see now there's more and more psychic mediums of spouting up. It's like they're being born and coming into this world and they're having better and better and more powerful gifts. Well, imagine that amplified by 10 million years. Now you got people who can manipulate mass and matter by thought. And I see no reason why that can't be for alien species. If they're 100 million years more advanced than this, they'll be almost like they're connected to the other side, even though they're still physical. Their brain will have that much more capability for connection to the other side and have abilities to do um, miraculous things. And that's how I think people are cured in these terrible diseases and stuff. It's a matter of belief. If you truly believe that you're going to be cured you will self-heal. As Jesus said, you know, there's a clue right there in the Bible. Your faith has cured you. It's that belief. That's the key to healing in this world. Uh, people can heal each other or heal themselves. But it's tough believing that you could just do that just because you believe that you can do it. And that's where a lot of people fail. They can't self-heal because they just feel that's just impossible. Mm. So you just can't think of that and it's going to work, but it's called the power of intention. 
So you mentioned that you studied an NDE knee death experiences. What led you to, I guess, going down that path when you're studying about the science and the physics of reality? What led me to do to join that too? Well, well also well, like I, I'm one of the things I'm really um, impressed and especially intrigued is let's just say if it's a doctor that only study from Western medicine, then that's one way. But if a doctor is learning about from Eastern medicines and different philosophies as well, I would much prefer to go to that doctor than the doctor that just only study one modality. So for you, you don't not only like just delve quite deep into the, the science and the physics world, but you also delve into the stuff that science couldn't really explain. Uh, like when why people come back and what the visions and when someone is pronounced brain dead, but yet all these things, they, they're aware of what's going on in this reality and mm-hmm. other reality and they're feeling more love than ever. So right. you've actually gone to that other side to study that in my mind, it makes you more all rounded to, well, yeah. Well, think about it this way. As I said before, since my theory is an intelligent design theory, right? So there's a creator. So uh, it would be very bad to leave the creator out of the whole creation process because, you know, he is the creator. He did the work. He knows how it's done. He knows how it works. So to ignore that, it would be like a a scientist basically sticking their head in the sand and saying, I don't want to know this. I don't believe in it. I'm I'm just going to blindly do what I'm going to do. And I only trust my senses. What I hear, what I see, what I feel, what I smell, that's a very limited way to gather knowledge. Uh, Don't get me wrong. I love scientists, but I have to say science has its limitations. Scientists see the world in different ways as each discipline sees the world in part, but not the whole. There are scientists that have spent their entire time here on Earth looking through a keyhole the keyhole being the scientific method. They have spent their lives trying to widen that keyhole in order to see more and know more. And now I am attempting to widen that keyhole by explaining that our reality comes from the creator who is the source of everything. Many scientists will, upon hearing the keyhole can be widened by ways they can't even imagine, will quickly reject the possibility. I accept that many will do this, but that isn't stopping me from doing the work I need to do. And it's about awakening. And and that's the process. You have to accept all that is. And and we have very limited ability in the physical form to branch out unless we expand our consciousness in ways uh, such as we've discussed tonight. You use psychics you use those intuitive abilities infusion from spirit guides and so forth these things are all real that's the point here there is a god i don't just believe that i know that for sure and it's time that everybody else just try to come on board with that because that's what the truth is it's not that I'm pushing a religion. A- any religion is fine. There are many paths to God. Buddhism, Catholicism, Judaism, uh, all these faiths are fine. Our problem is in our way we interpret them. That's how we've gotten into trouble. So now we just, just need to know there are many paths to God, and God is all about love, pure knowledge, infinite love, infinite knowledge, infinite power. And uh, when we embrace that truth, that knowledge, we'll be able to know more, know more than we can have ever imagined before. But that, I'm just really about that, that idea, that concept of joining religion to science. And in the end, religion really overrides science. And, and there's going to be a lot of people who don't like that since everything comes from a spiritual being. The spirit realm is uh, is going to subsume the intellectual physical realm because it created the physical realm. So it's the master of this realm. Mark, I think what you're alluding to is that most um, scientists are using the five senses as the way of measurement, but 
they are more than the five senses. And I, I think some scientists, I don't know whether there's a unilateral um, agreement on how many senses are there, but if you close your eyes and ask you to touch your nose, well, you know how that is another sense. I forgot the terminology for that, but if you can close your eyes and you're not using your sense of sight to touch your nose, but yet you know where Facial. you know. Facial. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's that's one sense. I think like that, at least 13 to 20 or even more senses, but the senses of connecting to high intelligence that's another one of the senses or one of the many other senses that one could have what you've tapped into rather than ignoring that apart from the five senses, that's it. There's no more. You've opened yourself up to, there are other channels of receiving information and using that to then compute how this world of reality actually works. Yeah. It's a good process, and uh, hopefully it will catch on and more people will do it. I, I think to some degree people are doing it now. When they trust their intuition and start making choices and decisions, not only with their mind and their logic, you should do two, the two together, but with also with uh, their intuition and their, their feeling, you know, talking to their heart and trying to understand, you know, where it is I need to go, and, you know, and having those kinds of conversations, you, you know, you basically, you have it, you establish a connection to the other side by admitting that it's there, it's real, and it wants to help you. There are spirit guides that are with each and every person on this planet, whether they believe it, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. They've been with them since the time they were born and will be with them to the last breath. And, and that's good news. And that's real news. That's just the way this system works. That's by design. And it's to help us get through this physical experience, which is incredibly challenging and difficult task to get through life. I don't have to tell you that. I mean, <laughs> everybody out there has had their ups and their downs. And it's a challenging experience. And we need all the help we can get. And they're there to help us. And Mark, from the way that you speak, it's not as if someone just read some texts or somebody's stories having a an, an, an knee-death experiences or the benefits of meditation or about spirit sky. When you spoke just then, you had a, a degree of inner knowing. Has there been certain or numerous events that's happened in your life that you know without a doubt that they are... Uh, greater intelligence, there's spirits guide, there's, there's, there's a greater source out there. Or maybe if, if there's multiple occurrences, like maybe you could share like what are some of the earlier or the more profound experience that you've had is that, wow, like I didn't <clears> even know there was something outside or I always had a hunch, but wow, this really solidified my belief that there's something more to life. Oh yeah, there's lots. And that's why I'm going to write a, a second book, a prequel to this book. And that's all it's going to be about. And the only reason I've decided to write this book is the second book is, it's a prequel, it's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> is that um, within what's in this book and these discoveries, I've now been thoroughly convinced they're correct and real. So it's this book that I've written now is a big deal. And now people are going to want to know, how did, like you just asked, <laughs> how did this all come about? You know, what happened? So I'm going to tell that story. And there are many, I've had many instances, experiences uh, connecting me to the spiritual realm that they demonstrated to me, you know, little personal miracles. And I, I could tell you a, a couple just to give you an idea of what happened, how they affected me, how they changed my thinking, how they awakened me to the idea, wow, there is an afterlife. And people don't die when they pass away from the physical realm. Their consciousness is still there. It, they're alive still. They're in another place where we can't see or hear them directly, but they're okay. And that's good news and happy. And so, yeah, there's been many experiences. I could tell you one where they saved my life, mm. really saved it from, from dying, you know. In, in life, sometimes you have what are called exit points. There are points where if 
there's going to be an intersection between your path and the path of something else that's going to cause you to lose your life if you're not careful. I had one of these intersections, and as I'll tell you about it. I'm driving home from work from IBM, and I have two ways I can go home every day. So I come up to this intersection. It's a T intersection. So there's a road going this way in front of me, and my road dead ends. And so I can either go left or I can go right. And if I go right, it's busier traffic, a little more stoplights, it's a little shorter. Uh, and if I go left, it's a little longer, but it's much more peaceful, country roads and so forth. Most days I go left because I just like to unwind as I drive home. So as I'm driving up to the intersection, I'm saying to myself, oh, I'm going to go left today. And when I said that in my mind, I hear a voice in this left ear say, don't go that way. And now I'm not talking about I heard in my head my voice say that. It was as if somebody was right next to my ear speaking into the ear. So, you know, I don't normally hear voices. <laughs> so this was the one and only time this happened. And I shook my head and I whipped around because I thought there was somebody in the car. And I looked and there was nobody there. And I just said that that couldn't be. So I proceeded a little further and I was about to you know, make the turn and then it said again, don't go that way. So at this point, I had to decide what to do. What do you think I did? You went right? <laughs> no, I went left. I went that way. Um, why? Because I'm a, at the time, I was a skeptic. Yes. I couldn't believe what just happened happened. So now I needed evidence. So I needed to see the danger because why else warn me? Nobody's ever done that before, ever. So there must be something coming up ahead. And I thought, well, it's going to be a head-on collision, maybe. So the whole time I'm driving, I'm looking ahead. I'm trying to stay close to traffic so nothing can hit me. And I'm looking ahead the whole time. So as I'm driving home, sure enough, up ahead, I see this truck driving wildly. It's a pickup truck going into the other our lane. It's a two-lane road, right? And this truck is coming at me and at the traffic in my lane, and it's causing them to steer off the road and go into the ditch. And, you know, I'm saying, holy cow, he's coming right at me. So I turn my wheel as hard as I can, and I miss him by inches. I see this guy go rocketing by, spins out, and stops in the middle of the road finally after scaring, you know, a half a dozen people to death, almost hitting them head on. So now I have evidence. I was warned by somebody that I couldn't see or hear up until that point who was trying to save my life. And instead of listening to them, I did something stupid. And I didn't listen to them because I didn't have faith. Now I have more than faith. I know for sure they're with me. And I apologized to them in the car as I sat there uh, in the road, off the road in a ditch. And I says, I could have died because I didn't listen to you. The only reason I survived was they changed my thinking so I was observing ahead. So I was able to take action and avoid the head-on collision. Had I been just driving home without that warning, I would have been daydreaming or whatever I usually do, which you know, it's not all the time focused on driving as it should be because you're thinking about things as you're going home. I might have missed it and not been able to take evasive action. So there's rock solid evidence that a scientist could even (laughs) have trouble explaining. This is, I did predict the future because somebody warned me who could see ahead. You see, being on the other side, it's like they're in a helicopter flying above the whole thing. So you see, you know, you're going down the road, they know which direction. You're seeing the other guy coming, they hate. You're saying, oh my God, they're gonna intersect ahead. So we got to do something to prevent this because it's not his time yet. They could probably read your thoughts that you're planning to go left. Absolutely. They could read my thoughts. They all can read. All of your thoughts are recorded. Yeah. Everything you do, say, and speak, when you get to the other side, you'll see, because they're going to play it all back. Yeah. Every last minute moment of your life is recorded and goes into the book of life. And that's 
just the way it is. And it's a good thing, you know, it's part of the uh, life experience that we humans share with our creator who we are a part of. And we're like a thread in the tapestry of the creator, a single thread, our lifetime. And when that goes back, that thread gets added to the tapestry and it becomes part of the history of all things. Uh, the Kashik record or Kashik record, or however you pronounce it, is that same thing, that book of knowledge that is part of everyone. We are all together. We are all connected. There is no separation. This, that is an illusion uh, so, in the physical form. We, you know, it's an illusion that we have when we're born into the flesh. So after the knee uh, accident, when you go home, uh, what do you do? How, how were you at night? Because I well, remember I, like one of the first major times that divine intervention showed up. I was just like, wow, like what happened? And it so happened for me, I had a few books that randomly picked out during the daytime a few hours earlier that was about um, the soul journey and about different things that kind of were clues that there was left for me. There was breadcrumbs leading me to a trail of discovery. Like, so what, what do you do the night after? Well, I went home and I talked to my wife about it and I said this incredible thing happened. I replayed the whole story and then I apologized out loud to my, now I'm, I, I already knew that I had spirit guides because I went to a, a medium many years before and they, she actually introduced me to my two spirit guides, a man and a woman. So I always had that in the back of my head. Could I see them? No. Could I hear them? No. All the way up until that day. Then I heard the male one. That's who talked to me. Apparently his job is to keep me alive. You know, keep me from dying before my time. Because I got work to do. We all have work to do. So yeah, I thought about it. Uh, I just incorporated it. I let that come into me and I looked at it and thought about it and said, okay, this is rock solid evidence. You just experienced uh, a connection, a real verification that there is an afterlife. It's going on. It's right there with you. It's in a, just in parallel. You can't quite see it. It's on the edge of your vision. You know, it's, uh, there's something there. It's real. You're, you're being escorted through life. And from that point on, you know, I was really on board with, well, there is an afterlife and they are helping us and they're here with us. Uh, there is some other dimension. We probably came from that dimension when we were born. So there was a lot of things that I was thinking about because of that and things that happened after that, more little evidences, proof actually that came from prayers and stuff that were answered, another small miracle. Now I'm gonna put all of these things in the book because this helps build uh, the the knowledge not just i'm going beyond belief here belief is a great thing but knowing is even more important it's even it's higher up than just believing in something when you yeah. know it for sure that's the highest level that's knowledge that's that's what you want to get to and I, uh, yeah like i haven't really presented an argument with the skeptics that there are more to life beyond but like just from my perspective when you study an NDE and especially when you study kids that can remember their past lives or people right. that have died maybe a hundred years early in a different part of the world and you they can find information so specific only that person or, or intimate family would know and especially before the age of the internet there are no way and these aren't coincidence so i'm sure the skeptics will find some way to dispel the information and but like to me like like what you just shared and i'm guessing some of the things you're putting like in the book is just that's how the world really works beyond just thinking that we are not connected to the plants kingdom there's no life after death and once our physical body dies that's it I guess based on the information that's available of people that have actually have these experiences and you just ignore it, then it's a very limited view of the world. Right, right. Well, you're not going to convince everybody. 
You know what really does the trick better than everything, anything else? Their own personal miracle happens, their own near-death experience. That takes, that takes people who are agnostic or atheists and turns them around just like that. Because when they personally experience it themselves, then they got to question whether they're sane or not. And if they come to the conclusion they're sane, then what happened was real. And, and then, then they have to deal with that. Uh, event, and that convinces a lot of people, but there probably be many people that will go to their grave not believing in an afterlife. And a lot of doctors, uh, medical doctors, are really uh, uh, either agnostic or atheists. And, and they, they will steadfastly, they will argue, I don't care what kind of NDE evidence you present to them that proves consciousness exists after death, they just will try to explain it away any way they can. Oh, it was drugs. It was this. It was a hallucination. It was, you know, wait a minute. How did this person know what these other people were talking down the hall while they were lying on the, the bed in the operating table dead? How did they get their consciousness to hear the other conversation? Explain that one to me with drugs. <laughs> There is no explanation, and, and they'll just stammer and stumble and usually get upset <laughs> that you even bring this up because it's just not that way. Yeah. Well, you know what? You're always going to win this argument, Gary. And you know why? Because sooner or later, they're going to die. Yeah. And then the truth is <laughs> when you're standing there looking at your body lying on the bed and you say, hey, I recognize that person. That was me. But. It's not me. I'm here. I'm okay. I'm looking at it. And all of a sudden, I don't identify with it anymore. And that's yeah. time and time again what happens to NDE people. As soon as they're out of their body, out of the flesh, back into the spirit form, everything is beautiful. Everything they know is okay unless they have a negative near-death experience, which happens every once in a while, yeah. usually to uh, uh, people who don't believe in God. And they need a little razzle dazzle to get them on board with that but um uh that argument in death always settles that argument now do you believe <laughs> you're not you didn't cease to exist you didn't go into nothing you're still there you're having a conversation with yourself you're thinking uh, but you're not in your body anymore and um most people come on board pretty quick after that yeah so one other concept I want to ask you about is what are quantum entanglement? And by understanding this, like what is the significance of the application to how we live our life? Believe it or not, I spent a lot of time on that little nifty problem that Einstein came up with called the EPR paradox, right? And um, I fell into the trap that Einstein set for Niels Bohr and thinking that entanglement meant that there was spooky action at a distance. And so for years, I tried to figure out a physical explanation for the spooky at a distance connection using mechanics. I wrote papers after paper after trying to explain how you could communicate through space. And I actually did come up with a method uh, that would require true entanglement of the two uh, particles or photons or electrons, whatever you want to use. And finally, one day I realized that was a trick, a trap by Einstein to confound uh, and, you know, make Niels Bohr uh, stumble in their debates about quantum mechanics. It can't be that those particles are communicating faster in light. light. So what I realized was when they're created, the two entangled particles, they just have like a bunch of settings, you know, polarization, let's say. One is the opposite of the other. Well, what they do in the experiment is they make those photons pass through polarizers on the way to the detectors. What they don't realize is that they're strengthening the correlation between the one polarized this way and the one polarized this the other way. 
Uh, so there's an incomplete understanding of using the polar. The system as it's set up is flawed. So what it's doing is tuning the particles so they have a higher than normal correlation, which they can match up with quantum mechanics equation. Therefore, I saying, therefore saying somehow there is a community, uh, faster than light communication, but not really, you know, I love that explanation. Well, you know, there's really no, but somehow one knows the other particle. When you read the one, the other one knows to switch to the polarization opposite. That's when you get bad explanations like that, there's something very wrong in their assumptions. So all I'm saying is the reason why it looks like there's an entanglement is that this guy over here got set when the photon was born in a double jump of an electron. The other one gets set in the other opposite polarity. They go out, there's a correlation there, there is. And um, as long as you don't mess with either one and switch the polarization, you, you can measure this one and then the other one will be the opposite. Seems like they're communicating, they're not. It was already set ahead of time. And what they did by forcing these things in the apparatus through polarizers, they strengthen that because they say, hey, I'm going to turn this polarizer in this direction and this one, <laughs> and then force them through. And then I'm going to measure them and see how many match. Well, you whatever polarization that was at that might not have been totally 90 degrees out, well, it will be when it gets through the polarizers. So you get a higher than normal polarization, which makes you think or appear that there's some sort of spooky connection going on. Now, there's actually no spooky connection going Got on. It. It's, it's the way we measure. And we're not fully aware that we're manipulating. Anytime you touch something, or you affect it in any way with a polarizer or any other bouncing something off, you're changing that something you measure. So you're changing the statistical odds mm -hmm. of what's going on. So they're just not up to speed. And, <laughs> you know, it, it could be debated for years, but it's really just there's a correlation at the beginning. And if you do something to strengthen it, which they did, you get higher than expected results, which seems like there's a connection going on, but there really isn't any connection at all. So um, we didn't get time to cover the creation of the universe, but for anyone that wants to learn more about, I'm sure that um, they can follow the, the links on the show notes to go to your website to, to take a look and, and read the book as well. What I wanted to ask as, as the final question is um, understanding a lot of the science and the creation and also from the metaphysical uh, and the mystical side of things, what do you believe our purpose on Earth is to? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I think many philosophers and many people just in general are wondering that, and want to know. And I, I liken it to, well, we this is like a, an amusement park ride. You're born, you go from your spirit uh, body into your you're pushed literally at the moment usually that you're born into your body or just before you're born. Um, and you go through a life experience. Here in this physical realm, there's many limitations. In the afterlife, there are no limitations. There's, it's a perfect realm. Here, you can struggle. Uh, and because you can struggle and have difficulty, it's a great challenge. And a great challenge is, and struggling, suffering even, is a great gift in a way because it'll awaken you, right? What happened to you, what happened to me, struggles in your life get you thinking, changing your, your thought process, what, what you believe in, what you, you know, your, your whole mission. So you're, you're born to have the, all these experiences and take it back to God. And basically, God's gift to you is your life. Your gift to him is what you do with it. And the better you make use of that life, you know, sharing love and learning and experiencing all that you can, um, the more valuable and the, the more 
rewards, afterlife rewards you get, and that knowing you've made, you know, had some accomplishes, accomplishments, you've made, got, you survived these struggles and so forth. And uh, it's a great experience. So it's an experience, a learning experience. For some people, it may just be, you know, hey, why don't you go have a good lifetime, have a lot of fun. It may be recreational in some way. Uh, I think it's a little combination of everything, but it's like a ride. You get on the ride, you get your turn, and then you get off the ride. When you get off the ride, you're back home, really. I mean, the other side is home, not here. It seems like it's home when you're here, but really, once you're over there, you remember everything again in your home. So it's, it's a valuable way to grow faster. Because on the other side, you can still grow and learn, but it, they say it takes longer there. Here, it's like a shortcut. It's painful. It can be very painful, but you can grow leaps and bounds by going through the, the physical realm and the physical experiences. So that, to me, is what life's all about. It's a learning experience, and basically learning how to love each other is the, the main thing here. That's, okay. that's the toughest challenge, and that's what it's all about. I like that. Um, and if someone feels like that within the amusement park, they're going through a haunted house right now. <laughs> it, we've seen from a macro level, there's various protests that are going on around the world and people are feeling unease with the life situation. What advice would you have for them that would make the journey through this so-called haunted house more pleasant? Uh, you have to realize no matter what happens here, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how many things go wrong, it's going to be all right. As soon as you get to the other side, your happy ever after begins. Everything will be explained, why you went through, why all this stuff is happening. Everything is understandable. You're connected back to the, the loving source, God, Jesus, whoever it is, that your spirit guides, whoever it is talks to you and gets you on board again, you'll realize it's like this. You, you need to, everyone needs to stop looking down at the ground, listening to the traffic noise, getting upset about, I got to be here. I got to do this. I got to have this. You know, what if this happens? All these fears, just look up at the sky and look up at the clouds every once in a while, sit in your backyard, relax and look up and remember that no matter how dreary, rainy, cold, nasty it here it is at the ground level up above the clouds it's always a sunny day and and that's what the afterlife is that eternal sunny day and no matter what your struggles here you know it's going to come out and be okay hmm. um it reminded me when i visited new zealand i didn't even know beforehand but we happened to stayed at a place that is regarded as the biggest dark reserve out there, which is like, it doesn't have street lights and, and there's a certain regulation that you can't have your lights on after a certain time or something. And mm -hmm. at night I randomly just walked out and looked at the stars and it's like, you can see so many stars and you can see the, the galaxy, the Milky Way. Yeah. Like, wow. I've, loved it. Yeah. I've never seen that. Yeah. When you see that, it's like, the need or the yearning to watch TV, it goes down significantly because that is the entertainment you get from that when the stars is, is literally twinkle, twinkle, little stars. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, and there yeah. is more to this world than just us when you can see right. so many stars out there that's shining and, and twinkling. And sometimes during the daytime, what you described in the clouds and the way that it moved is, is so magnificent as well. And I guess it's, it's taking a macro view that that whatever happens, and, and I guess some of the text that talks about surrender to the flow of life, let's just, when you can be at peace with what's the worst that can happen, if I have to sleep on the street, then so be it. If I die, so be it. If, if I split up with this person, then so be it. If you can mm. come to terms, that if that is your path, then so be it. Then there's no more resistance and life happens a lot smoother. You just got, yeah, you just got to learn to deal with it in a positive way, no matter what life throws at you. And when you do that, you, you always come through okay. But it's tough because people tend, and I'm as guilty of that as anybody, 
you know, you get a flat tire, you get go into a rage, uh, you know, you just get angry at everything and everybody because you got a flat tire and um, you got to learn to just step back and say, oh, I got a flat tire. I guess I, get, I better fix it. And you fix it and you move on. And it, what, it's your choice as to how you feel. Your choice. Nobody can make you feel any way you want. I mean, that's the thing about watching TV. Uh, they scare you into things and, and make you feel bad because you, you're lulled into it. But ultimately, it's up to you to say, no, turn off the TV, uh, turn off that kind of thinking and say, OK, yeah, this was a bad break here a little bit. But, you know, it's a lesson to learn. Remain calm. Don't get mad at everybody around you. You know, don't, you know, become, you know, shooting a bird or whatever. And, you know, don't get, a, don't have road rage. Road rage never ends well. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to die and, or somebody's going to go to jail. And those are not all good things. All you have to do is choose not to get angry. And it's all about learning how to love your fellow man. And, the, you know, it's easy to say, but not so easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And if you can get on board with that, the more you get on board with it, the less you get aggravated by these little things, the more peaceful, happy and contented you become. Yeah, you remind me of a more spiritual version of Einstein. <laughs> he, I, was pretty, he was actually pretty spiritual. Yeah, too. I mean, I, he I, was I, I think he was, was from a lot of different things that was quoted and mentioned. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't a theist like me. I mean, I believe not only in, that God created the universe, uh, but I also believe that he intervenes in sustaining personal relationship with, you know, all of us, all of his creatures. In other words, you are at the center of God's attention. I am at the center of God's attention. All 8 billion people are. Every grain of sand on every planet, everywhere in the universe is at the center of God's attention. That's how it works. That's what a theist believe. He's involved with not only creating the universe, but everything thereafter, constantly creating, co-creating with us and other beings. Uh, he's aware of everything, everywhere, and, you know, connected to, we are connected to everything. So that's, you know, Einstein just believed God created the universe and, you know, okay, that's okay. I'm going to do something else now. Mm -hmm. But you no, know, so I, I do go a little bit beyond that. And I'm sure Einstein now knows that God is very much involved with everyone, everywhere, and everything. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for uh, the generosity of your time and sharing the wisdom for anyone that wants to learn more about your work, they can go to um, your website, super-relativity.com. Uh, and um, there's a great book trail I'll share in the show notes as well. They can check out um, his book. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And um, if you like what you've heard, click the like, subscribe, comment, and love to hear from you. And gratitude to you, Mark. Thank you.